Okay. So this meeting is going to go live on Facebook and eventually you will find it on YouTube as well. If you guys wanna share uh, the very interesting information that we're gonna have online for today. Yeah. But the participants will be getting a free intake. Oh, and just to keep you guys motivated for today's webinar, we actually will be offering a free consultation. Oh, and just to keep you guys motivated for today's webinar, we actually. Okay. So, you know, just feel free to reach out to our firm. Um, I've written in the webinar chat our phone number, email address, and also our website where you can definitely reach out to us if you have any questions regarding the content of today's webinar or any other immigration related issue that we may be able to help you with. So we'll get started in a few minutes. We're just letting people trickle in and we are officially now live on Facebook. Great. So uh, 6 30 p.m. guys let's just wait for a couple of more minutes allow people some time to settle in find their their placing in the in the chat today hi Ramona it's so good to see you today thank you so much for joining us um, we're just taking some time to let you guys settle in and then we'll get started all right Feel free to use the chat um, to communicate with us. If you have any questions that come up during the consultation, during the presentation, you can definitely write to us there. Uh, you can use the chat or the Q and A. Um, I will be looking at it multiple times today to see if I can address any questions um, or if we can direct them towards the attorney. Yeah. Great. So let's wait a few more minutes, allow people to settle in. Um, just to kind of give you guys a very quick introduction. My name is Catalina. I work for um, Elise Law Firm in the acquisitions department. We are looking to make this space available for your participation so that you feel um, that you can ask any questions that you might have, anything that might come up regarding immigration or otherwise, uh, we're more than happy to answer those questions for you today. And also we are offering a free consultation um, for those who decide to participate in today's webinar. So feel free to participate as much as you want today, but you will have credit for a free consultation. with our firm. All you have to do is reach out to us via um, our landline 305-371-8846. We also have our website, which is elisealawfirm.com. All right. Thank you so much for joining today, Leticia and Samuel. It's our pleasure to host for today, Ramona. Thank you so much for being here. So just so you guys have um, an idea of what we're gonna be doing today, we're gonna be focusing on marriage-based green cards. So how to go about getting your green card through marriage. This is our very first webinar at the Elise Law Firm. We're very excited to be here with you today, both on Zoom and also live on Facebook. We do intend to do more of these webinars. Um, we wanna make sure that we are giving you guys the information that you need, making sure that we're staying connected. If you guys have any feedback for us as to which topics you guys would like for us to cover next, you know, we're all ears. So make sure to drop a comment either in the Facebook um, comment section or on the Zoom. Correct. Um, also, I just wanted to remind you very quickly that we do have our chat and our Q&A enabled for your comfort. So if at any time during the meeting you feel like you want to ask a question, you have any comments, 
uh, regarding the topic of discussion for today, which is marriage-based green cards. Um, we'd love to hear you out. Please write out your message, raise your hand as you choose. Um, okay, great. So we're just gonna let people, we're gonna give people a little bit of room to join, let them trickle in as they come on. Two more minutes and we'll get started. Yeah. Oh, you know what? While we get started, why don't I tell everyone a little bit about our law firm? We are located in Miami, Florida. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, um, you can definitely reach out to us. Our phone number is 305-371-8846. Our website is also enabled for online inquiries at elizelawfirm.com. Uh, uh, we have various... Uh, Oh, thank you so much for, for joining it. For, we, we appreciate having you guys here. We have uh, on staff Spanish, French, Haitian Creole, and English, of course, speakers to assist you with whatever you may need. I just wanted to very quickly remind you guys that for joining today's seminar, you do have uh, credit for a free consultation with our attorney. It's absolutely complimentary. Um, it could be about the topic of discussion for today or any other topic. So please take advantage of the fact that you guys have this consultation. Reach out to us via our phone number, email address, or website, which is posted in the comments. And I think we can get started. Sounds great. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, one moment, please. So while you're sharing your screen, I do see a first question that's coming up, which is, do we have an office in Colombia, Medellin specifically? Um, because I see that Bert works with a translator in Colombia and some of the clients need help assisting with their fiance visas. We do not have an office in Colombia. However, um, being an immigration attorney and an immigration firm, we are able to help clients from all over we actually do have clients in Colombia and in the Caribbean, in Europe. So from where we are right now, so physically we're located in Miami, but we do help people from all over with all of their immigration issues, including their fiance visas. Okay. That being said, uh, we do work in a variety of languages. Uh, as I have said before, we have people who who are unable to translate into French, English, uh, Spanish, and Haitian Creole. Okay, just one more minute, please. Thank you so much for your patience. And let's get started. Great. Okay. So as we were discussing earlier, our topic of discussion for today is marriage-based adjustment of status, a pathway to U.S. immigration, otherwise known as marriage-based green cards, right? How to legalize our status in the U.S. through marriage. Uh, just to give you guys a very quick overview, uh, our attorney, managing partner at Elise Law Firm is Patricia Elise. She is barred in the state of Florida. So even though you guys are in different parts of the world, of the country, we are enabled to assist you guys um, from the state of Florida. So Anything regarding legal immigration into the U.S., we may be able to assist you. We have, uh, we are able to assist you with anything regarding um, adjustment of status, consular processing. We work with getting your family into the U.S. We assist you with uh, visas, parole, and many, many more topics of discussion in the immigration front, um, which we'll be happy to get in touch with if you do decide to reach out to us. Our attorney um, graduated from the Miami School of Law and she has a master's in uh, law as well. All right, uh, you might've also seen our attorney in various key appearances. Uh, so definitely NBC, ABC, Afro Studio and uh, Show Carella. 
as well as various uh, radio appearances. So without further ado, this is Attorney Patricia Elise. I'll give her the floor to continue on with today's webinar. Thank you, Catalina. That was really sweet. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Patricia Elise. I am the managing attorney at the Elise Law Firm. I established this law firm back in 2000. 11, I, 2011 already, so a lot of time has passed. I'm very excited to be here with you. At our law firm, we focus currently exclusively on immigration cases. And I'm excited to start this series of webinars mm -hmm. where we're able to go into in-depth conversations on different topics of immigration law. Next slide, please. Okay. So let's get right into it and again please feel free to post your questions in the comments as well as use the question and answer section of um of the zoom so that we're going to be able to either address it while we're talking or at the end of the conversation so what are the pathways what are the pathways of getting your green card based off of marriage well technically speaking there's three different ways three different pathways of getting your green card through marriage in the United States. The first way or the first option is called adjustment of status. Adjustment of status is when the immigrant is physically inside of the United States and qualifies to adjust their status, which means change their status from the status they had prior to a lawful permanent resident or a green card holder. Um, what are the main things you need to know about this process? Well, number one, you will qualify if you are married to a US citizen or if you're married to a green card holder and the visa is currently available. So that's a little, that's a little tricky, but just for purposes of today, just keep in mind that there may be a possibility, even if you're married to a green card holder, it's just that the immigration attorney has to go back and double check the system to make sure that you can move forward with an adjustment of status. But typically speaking, to qualify for adjustment of status, you have to be married to a US citizen or a green card holder, the visa is available, you're physically present, and you have evidence that you legally entered into the US. Now, there's different ways of showing that you entered legally in the US. You may have entered, for example, um, with using a tourist visa, right? So that's really easy to show. You have a copy of the visa in your passport, you have the stamp in your passport, you may have an I-94. You may have entered with a business visa, a student visa. You may have also entered through the border um, and at the border, they may have given you parole, um, which will look, which you'll have an I-94 in your hand that you can show, listen, this is evidence of how I entered lawfully into the US. So typically to qualify for adjustment of status, you have to show that you're legally married to a US citizen or a green card holder, that the visa is currently available to you and that you lawfully entered the US. And lastly, that you're not barred from being qualified for a green card. Attorney, one of the questions that comes up very frequently is, how do I get this I-94 that you're talking about? What is an I-94? Yes, that's, that's a great question. So an I-94 is the document that is given to you by CBP, which is Custom Border Patrol, that actually shows you when you are allowed to stay in the U.S. for how long you're permitted to remain in the U.S. on your non-immigrant status. Now, for those of you who remember about 10 years or so ago, up to 10 years or so ago, whenever you traveled into the US, at the airport, they would give you a little white card and that white card you would put in your passport and there'd be a date that says you have to leave the US before this date. Well, they no longer give you this paper document. Um, now you actually have to go online where you verify how long you are able to stay in the US by verifying your I-94. So you put in your full name as it appears on your passport your passport number, your date of birth, and your nationality, and you're able to pull up not only your current I-94, but also your um, travel history in the past, okay? Great. So in the gist of it, that's the explanation of the adjustment of status process. Okay. So the second pathway to citizenship through a green card um, in the US is called consular processing. 
It's called consular processing because the last step is done at the consulate, right? So the way that it works is the US citizen petitioner, which is your spouse or the lawful permanent resident is actually gonna file an I-130 petition on your behalf stating that they are legally married to you. Um, it's a real marriage and they would like for you to be able to come to the US as a green card holder. Once the I-130 is approved, the second step of the consular processing is that the case goes from the US-based USCIS, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services Agency, and is now sent to the National Visa Center, which is under the State Department. Now, the National Visa Center will request additional documents about for your case. Once your case is ready, your case will be then sent to your local consulate. Now, your local consulate can either be the consulate of your nationality or the consulate where you're currently lawfully residing. So for example, if you are a Haitian citizen and you're currently living in Paris, you have two different consulate you may qualify to go for your, the last step of your consular processing. If you're lawfully in, in France and you have, for example, a, um, a green card or the equivalency of a green card in France, or you have dual nationality, or you have some type of work visa or student visa, you will have access to the US consulate in France. If not, then you will also have access to the US consulate in your home country at this point, which will be Haiti. So that's the overall gist of consular processing. Um, the big difference between the adjustment of status and the consular processing, both of them you're married to either a US citizen or a lawful permanent resident. But the big difference is for the adjustment of status, everything is being done together. It's a one-step process. Everything is being adjudicated together. Everything is being sent together. Um, both your spouse asking for the green card for you and also your request for that green card, right? But for consular processing, it's broken down into different steps. First, because you're not physically in the US, they have to request the green card for you. Once that request is approved, then the actual green card has to be processed by the case being sent to the National Visa Center. And finally, the last step of consular processing is going to the consulate in person for an interview, okay? Great. Um, so the last, the, the last and third pathway or way that you're able to get a green card for marriage in the US is a fiance visa. So we've all seen, you know, 90 day fiance on TV. We've all seen it on social media. This is really what it covers. Um, a fiance visa, it's only a US citizen. So if you're engaged to a lawful permanent resident, they're not gonna qualify to ask for a fiance visa for you. So it has to be a US citizen who's gonna file a request for you to enter the US, not with your green card, but with a visa that says you have the intent of getting married. Once the fiance visa is approved and you go to the consulate, the visa is put in your passport, and you physically enter the US, you have 90 days, 90 calendar days to get legally married. And you have to apply for adjustment of status, right? Which is the first pathway we spoke about. And you finish and you get your physical green card here. Now, what's interesting and a lot of people don't realize about the fiance visa is if you enter the US on a fiance visa and you don't legally marry your petitioner, then you're not gonna to qualify to adjust your status by marrying someone else. So let me explain that a little bit. If you are currently engaged to a US citizen and that US citizen files for a fiance visa on your behalf, that fiance visa is approved and you come in on that fiance visa, you are legally obligated to get your green card through that spouse. So if you guys break up for any reason, and you decide, listen, I'm just gonna stay in the country regardless, and you marry someone else, that other person, that second potential petitioner, unfortunately will not qualify to apply for you for adjustment of status. We are, I, think, I think this is actually a topic that we get a lot of inquiries on, just because not everyone does apply for adjustment of status while they're in the U.S., and not everyone is necessarily married. So this is definitely something that we will be happy to address with you guys on a webinar later on, but also uh, using your free consultation credit after today's webinar for joining today. Thank you.
Um, I do see a question that is, is relevant here is, um, I'm a US citizen and my spouse is coming in from Europe, from Belgium, is coming in in August. Can we start the process before she comes in? Now, this is a very good question, right? Because there, the number one thing you have to say is, okay, which process are you guys looking at? Because if you're looking at consular processing, you're able to start the process at any time. If you are thinking about doing adjustment of status, now that gets a little trickier. And I would really recommend that you and your spouse sit down and speak to an immigration attorney so that um, you can really understand your options and the positive sides and the negative sides of, of each case for you. So if you already know for sure you want your spouse to get the green card while they're physically here, okay? Um, there's an unspoken policy with USCIS that says if you enter with a tourist visa, right? Um, they expect that you wait about 90 days before you file for that green card while the person is physically here. The reason that is, is you have to keep in mind the tourist visa is a non-immigrant visa, which means with the, the tourist visa, you're supposed to use it to come to the United States for a vacation for a few days, a few weeks, um, and then you go back home. Well, if you already know that you're coming to the US and you will overstay your tourist visa, then it gets a little tricky, right? Because at the airport, you're telling the officer that you're only coming in for pleasure, for vacation for a set number of time. But what immigration has acknowledged is it's understandable that an immigrant may come in with the intent of staying for a short period of time, but something may happen. Um, maybe there's a family emergency. Maybe your home country is not stable. Maybe you and your wife you know, or your spouse decided, listen, this is not gonna work for us being apart for so long. So changing your mind after a reasonable amount of time is something that immigration does take into consideration. And if you want to just put a set timeline to that, it's best to do it with an attorney that can kind of guide you a little bit better um, as to how to move forward with a case like that, okay? Here's another very common question. Uh, so Abdullaya is asking, it's been two months since the I-130 was approved. How long until the I-485 is approved? So he's asking about approximate timelines. Um, that's a really great question. So, and it, and it depends on a lot of things. Typically, with the adjustment of status, you're filing the I-130 and the 485 at the same time. So let me go back a little bit and um, explain. An I-130 is the petition that the U.S. citizen signs saying that they would like immigration to recognize their marriage and that they're asking for a green card for their spouse. The I-485 is the immigration application that the immigrant spouse will sign that says, based on the application that my spouse is filing, I would like the green card to be approved. Um, best case scenario, those applications are filed exactly at the same time but they are separate applications. So to, to approve the I-130 and to approve the 45, there are different factors that come into play. So the I-130 will be approved, right? If immigration sees that it's a bona fide relationship and the marriage was entered into um, legally, but the 485 has more considerations. So if the person has you know, a, an immigration history or a criminal history, or there has to be a background check that has to be done on the immigrant, then that 485 can be pending for a little longer. Or maybe there's an issue with the, um, the financial affidavit, or there's an issue with the background check or the medical exam. So all that is to say, typically, if they're filed at the same time, you'll see that they're approved at the same time. That's not always the case. When one application is approved and the other is pending, what we like to do is do follow-ups with USCIS, do inquiries on their behalf. Um, you know, go into the case, reach out to USCIS and the immigration officers and review the case so that the client has a better idea of why maybe the 485 is pending a little longer. Uh, so we'll be very happy to share those websites where we can file those inquiries later on in the presentation for you guys. We actually have a couple of really great questions, but in order to move on, 
um, to the next topic, I'm gonna leave those questions for, for the next uh, inter intermission. Sure. Okay. The next, um, the next slide is really, why is now the best time to file for a green card? So it is definitely my opinion that right now, um, May 23rd, 2023, is really the best time to file for a green card for these three reasons. The first, especially for adjustment of status. The first is that um, USCIS is actually currently waiving in-person interviews for marriage-based green cards, which is a game changer for everyone. So what does that mean? Before this policy change that took place maybe two, three months ago, Whenever you filed for a marriage-based green card, not only did you send evidence of the relationship with your initial petition, but you were also expected to go in person to be interviewed by an immigration officer that would double check all the information in your package and that officer would try to get a feel of the marriage. That is not happening anymore, which is great because the Biden administration has given immigration officers the discretion as to when they were going to require a couple to come in for an in-person appointment. So this has two, two impacts that I'm seeing on, our, on the files. Number one, more so now than ever, you want to make sure when you initial, initially file an application that is as strong as possible. Because before, um, immigrants and their spouses were really relying on going to that in-person interview and providing that updated information to the immigration officer and explaining in person, this is our story, this is how we met, this, you know, trying to convince the officer that it's a bona fide relationship. But now that the interviews are being waived, you wanna do your best to send in as much information as possible from the very beginning that it's a strong marriage, it's a real marriage, um, that you meet the requirements, because if that's done, the application will be approved, one, without an interview, and two, without a request for evidence. So what I'm seeing is instead of requiring clients to come in where the officer questions the, legit the legitimacy of the relationship, they're filing RFEs, requests for evidence. Please send me more evidence about the relationship. So right now, um, if you have a strong package and you're finally complete with immigration, you have a really great chance of not having to go into that in-person interview at all, which is great, you know? Um, a lot of people get nervous when they're in front of an immigration officer, especially if you don't understand the language really well. So being able to present your story with your spouse on paper and having the time to be in control of that is really great for immigrants that I'm seeing. The second reason that I find that right now is a great time to file for adjustment of status is because USCIS has actually proposed a significant increase in the filing fees for these for all petitions, right? Including the adjustment of status. So we have a slide later on that goes into the difference in prices, but um, the increase in all of the filing fees that I saw were the most significant in adjustment of status cases compared to other kind of cases. So this fee increase hasn't gone into effect as of yet, but we do expect that they will make the announcement as to when it will go into effect probably later this year. And again, the third reason, which is kind of encompasses everything, there's a faster processing time now for new petitions. So unlike a private business or a school or us individual folks, USCIS does not process cases in order, unfortunately, not all the time. What we're seeing is cases that we're filing today are being processed faster than cases that were filed a year ago. So it's not uncommon for us to see a new case that we filed be approved before a case that has been pending for about a year. And when we go on the USCIS website, when we check the processing times, when we're doing follow-ups for our cases that have been pending for longer than a year, USCIS is reassuring us it's within regular processing time. 
However, on a practical level, on a day-to-day -day basis that we're sending these um, files to USCIS, we are seeing that the new petitions are going a lot quicker. So this is definitely something to consider. If filing for adjustment of status or a green card or marriage-based petition is something that you or a family member have been thinking about, I would really, really urge for you guys to move forward with it because it's just the best time to do it, especially in the last two years. This is definitely the best time that I've seen to file a new petition for adjustment of status. Since we are on the topic of why now is the best time to file, uh, there is one question in our Q&A today. It was made by Ramona. She's a U.S. citizen, and she's now filing uh, for adjustment of status for her husband who joined her in the U.S. on a, two, on a B2 visa five months ago. So she just wants to know how long can he stay, how soon should she file? for adjustment of status for her husband before the changes and uh, the legal climate in Florida changes for immigrants, if he's been here for five months already? So if he's been here for five months, um, this is a really great time to file because if he entered with a regular B1, B2 visa, the I-94 is gonna expire in another month. Um, typically when you enter with a tourist visa, your I-94 of your um, permit of stay will expire after six months of entry. So filing now is a great time. Um, I definitely would not wait any longer. I know that we definitely have a lot of questions about the new Florida law that's gonna go into effect on July 1st. Um, we are planning on having a webinar specifically for that. But when it comes to purposes of a adjustment of status, it's not gonna affect people from what we're seeing right now they're applying for adjustment of status. Just so you know, once you file that adjustment of status in Florida, at least today, once you have those receipts in your hands, you will be able to go to the DMV and get a temporary driver's license for your spouse. So that also gives you some, you know, a sense of comfort knowing that there's a legal ID that's given to you by the state of Florida. Um, so I would definitely urge them to file as quickly as possible. You know, just making sure that obviously once the packet is ready, but this would be a great time to contact us, contact an attorney that you're comfortable with to put the package together to go out. Okay. Perfect. So uh, let's move on to the next topic. What do you think, attorney? Sure. Okay. Okay, okay great. So here we're going to go into what does the process really look like? And um, what do you need to show? What evidence do you need to provide, right? To show that you are qualified to adjust status through marriage. The first is that you're legally married. So a lot of people kind of overlook this step because they think that, well, obviously I'm married, that's enough. Yes, um, you wanna make sure that you have the marriage certificate, you have the proper marriage certificate firstly. I've seen clients make a mistake of sending, for example, the marriage certificate that was issued by their clergy instead of the state issued marriage certificate. You wanna make sure that any marriage certificate that you send is from an actual government entity, number one. And also, if you were married in another country, that that marriage certificate is the actual version of the marriage certificate that USCIS will actually accept. Now, don't forget, each country has different kinds of documents. Um, some may have a marriage certificate, some may have an archive of a certificate, some may have a different, a long version, a short version of a certificate. So you want to double check the visa reciprocity chart to make sure that the version that you're sending of your marriage certificate is the version that USCIS will actually accept, right? Um, the second thing is you want to be very careful if it's your second marriage or if it's your spouse's second marriage. Because USCIS, number one, will ask for the divorce decrees of the previous marriages. But the reason that they are saying that is they want those documents is to make sure that they're able to legally recognize your current marriage. For them to legally recognize your current marriage, they're going to double check that the first divorce was done properly per the laws of the US and per the laws of where you remarried. So I know it sounds a little complicated and I'll give an example. Um, 
we have a lot of clients from the Dominican Republic. We have a lot of clients from Haiti. In those countries, you're legally allowed to get a divorce, even though either you or your spouse are physically in the country or reside there. That is not gonna fly for immigration purposes. The reason being is under the public policy of the United States, they wanna make sure that if someone was divorced that, they, that the court that divorced them actually um, had jurisdiction over the case and also that the person had noticed. So I've definitely had a few cases where I've had to get the person either divorced and remarried or do an annulment of the first marriage and remarried because the way that the first divorce was done was not done properly. Therefore, immigration was not able to recognize the second marriage. So the first requirement is legally, you have to show that you're legally married. The second is you have to show a bona fide relationship. Now, what's a bona fide relationship? For, so bona fide means that it's a real relationship that you entered into this marriage for purposes of actually having a, sharing your life with your spouse, having a future with your spouse, that you didn't enter this marriage only but for your immigration documents. Now, again, um, I had explained that for the most part, immigration is waiving in-person appointments for green cards. So how are you going to prove that it's a real marriage if you're not going to be speaking to anyone, right? This is where you want to make sure that you're working with someone and really putting together a strong bona fides package. So how, and this is how I, we approach each case and each case is different. So we want to approach the case as how can we show on paper that this is a strong and real relationship? So everyone starts with photos. Photos are a great way to show that it's a real relationship. But I will tell you, if you give us 20 photos of selfies with your spouse and that's it, we will not send those photos. Because we want to make sure, for example, if we're sending any, any evidence of the relationship, that it shows that you're sharing your life with other people. Um, sending only selfies to immigration is a red flag. If you are in a real relationship with someone, you should be able to give us photos of hanging out with family and friends, Christmas dinners, New Year's Eve parties, things of that nature. So how you structure their photos are one, how you structure the shared financial responsibilities. Each couple again is different. Some couples have shared accounts. Some couples, they transfer money back and forth. So we just have to sit down and figure out, okay, how are we gonna show on paper, right? What documents we're gonna be able to show? Did the person, for example, update their um, school records to show that they're married? Who is listed as your emergency contact when you go to the doctor? So we'll sit down and do a custom list for our couples so that they have you know, a really good chance of showing a strong bona fide relationship. The third requirement is to show that the petitioner meets the residency requirements and the financial requirements. Now, if you're a US citizen and you do not reside in the US, immigration has a policy that says, if you're not residing in the US or you don't have the intent of coming back to the US, you shouldn't be able to give your spouse a green card, which makes sense. If you're residing abroad with your spouse, how are you gonna give them a green card? A green card is a lawful permanent resident status to lawfully and permanently reside in the US, right? So we wanna make sure that the petitioner has evidence of being a legal resident of a state in the United States before we're filing. And we also wanna make sure that the petitioner meets the poverty guidelines and we're able to show that they can sponsor their spouse for immigration purposes, okay? Attorney, before we continue, uh, just very quickly, do you feel that there's a need to wait after marriage in order to begin the process? Let's say I got married last Monday. Should I, is there a time frame or a time that I should be waiting before I start to file for, for uh, my husband, for example? No, so there's no, there's, no there's no required time that you have to wait between the time that you get legally married and the time that you file an application. What I will tell you is if you're putting together a strong package, it's gonna take you a few weeks. 
So getting legally married, working with an attorney to put a package together, you're not going to be able to get that done in a few days because you're going to be running around, getting us a lot of documents, getting us the evidence that we need, making sure we have the letters, et cetera. So by the time your packet is ready to be filed, you know, at least two, three weeks would have passed, which will be more than enough time. You don't have to wait any specific amount of time, but just to have that in your back, in the head, in the back of your mind, that on a practical level, you'll probably end up waiting a few weeks anyway to make sure that you have all the documents in order and that is a strong package. Got it. Okay. So the last requirement is um, that the immigrant warrants a positive discretion of the officer and that the immigrant is not barred from entry as a lawful permanent resident. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm guessing uh, by the fourth point that you made, what would you mean specifically on, on discretion of the officer? So any immigration application that you file, um, the last requirement is up to the discretion of the officer. So if in their own discretion, they find that it's not a real marriage, then they can deny it. In their own discretion, if they find that there's something wrong with the file, they can go ahead and deny it. And it. you want to make sure also... Um, if you have an immigration history, meaning if anyone has filed anything for you in the past, if you've been deported before, if you have a criminal history, if you've been arrested for anything, if you've been charged with anything, um, that it doesn't make it that you're no longer eligible for adjustment of status. So you want to make sure you get your file reviewed before moving forward with that as well. Thank you, attorney. All right. So uh, why don't we go over some of the important considerations for the process? Great. Um, so one of the important considerations is travel, right? So we, we went through three different ways that you're able to get your green card. Um, you could do it while you're physically in the U.S. if you qualify. You could do it through the consulate, right? Or you could go through the fiancé visa. We have clients where, for example, they may be currently working abroad, and they want to get the process started, but they're not able to come to the U.S. and stay. So due to travel considerations, they prefer to do the process through the consulate so that they're able to continue traveling back and forth to the U.S. So travel considerations is definitely something to look into. Um, the length of the process. Typically speaking, in my experience, I've seen that consular processing is definitely long, takes longer than adjustment of status. And that makes sense if you think about it, right? Because adjustment of status, you are filing the green card application in one step. Um, while consular processing, you're going through at least three steps. So the same amount of time that it takes to um, approve the I-130 and the consular processing, very often the entire case can be approved on an adjustment of status case. Okay. Now filing fees, we, we touched on that briefly. Um, some people, they decide, they decide to file uh, an adjustment status case and pay all the filing fees together, which is the way to go if you can afford it, but some people just can't. They may have to do one application at a time. And also take into consideration that the filing fees will be going up by this year. Okay. Okay. Um, uh -huh. The next one is what you need to gather. So I would highly recommend that even before contacting an attorney that you have current ID, current government ID. So not everyone has a current passport. It's important that you do that. Not everyone has a current copy of their birth certificate. Um, some countries, the birth certificates expire. So you have, to re you have to request a second version of the certified birth certificate that you can use. So those are great documents to start thinking about even before reaching out to a law firm. Um, and also just, if it's a marriage-based, you wanna start thinking, okay, how am I gonna prove on paper that I've been dating this person and for how long? You know, Do I have Facebook posts with them? Do I have um, Western Union transfers and how far back do those date? So you can start thinking about those kind of documents right now. And lastly, the interview process preparation. Um, as we spoke about for the adjustment of status, a lot of the interviews are being 
wave, but it's not all of them. So there may be the possibility that you're called in for an in-person interview. And obviously if you're doing the appointment abroad, you will have an in-person interview. And before you go, we definitely take the time to look up the requirements of that specific consulate because unfortunately each consulate is different. Each consulate has their own rules and procedures, their own requirements. So before you go in, we wanna make sure that we look up the requirements of the consulate that you're going to and to make sure that you're prepared for that interview. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, attorney. I actually have a question uh, from, from one of our attendees. Uh, it says, how would the law firm be able to accompany me through the process? And I think that's a really good question. Sure. So basically we take the case from you and we do it for you in the sense that when we, if you just, if you decide to hire the firm, the first thing that we do is we tell you everything that you'll need for the case. And we go through the checklist with you. We'll take an hour to an hour and a half, either in person on the video call and answer every question that you have about the kind of documents that you need to provide us. Once you have that list and you understand what you need to have a strong case, then we set a deadline for you to give us those documents. Um, typically, most clients take about three weeks to get us everything that we need. So we set the deadline and you give us the, all the documents together. From the documentation, we will prepare all of the immigration forms to make sure that everything is correct and everything matches. And we'll also put together the actual packet. So all you have to worry about is reviewing and signing. We'll send out the packet to USCIS. We'll do the follow-ups. We'll do the inquiries. We'll keep you updated. And if you have an in-person appointment in the US, especially in the South Florida area, um, we'll be able to prepare you or sometimes go with you. And if you have an appointment abroad, we'll also be able to prepare you. So we're basically holding your hand through the entire process from the very beginning up until you become a green card holder. And then once you have your green card, we'll remind you, this is when you're eligible to become a citizen. This is when you can file. Um, we didn't touch on it um, on, this, on this webinar, but just keep in mind, if you've been married for less than two years, you're gonna be given a conditional green card. If you've been married for more than two years, on the date that the green card is approved, you'll be giving a 10 year green card. So if your green card is approved and you have been married for more than two years, you have a two year green card, then you'll have to file an I-751, which is to remove the condition. So we'll also be there to help you with that process. Okay, uh, that's, that's fair. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, in the meantime, we'll start prepping up questions for uh, the end of the presentation. Sure. All right. Okay, great. So um, this is where we really see the difference in price that USCIS has proposed when it comes to filing fees for marriage-based cases. So we've been talking about the I-130 and the 485, the I-130 and the 485. Currently, the filing fee for an I-130 is $535. So um, with our files, for the most part, you'll see that you know the client will give us a cashier's check or it's very clear that money is not for us. It's to pay the immigration fee. It's $535. Immigration would like to raise it from $535 to $820, okay? And for the 485, which is the application for the actual green card, immigration wants to raise it from 1225 to 1540. Now that wouldn't be so bad, right? If you didn't take into consideration that they also now wanna make you pay a separate fee for the I-765 and the I-131 and the biometric. So what does that mean? Typically speaking, right now, the filing fees right now, when you pay 1,225, that covers the fee for your biometrics, which is your fingerprints, along with your temporary work permit, and along with your temporary travel permit. 
USCIS now wants to make it a separate filing fee for each one of those applications. So instead of paying 1,225 for the I-485 and everything that's included, you're gonna end up paying 3,910 to cover the I-45, the I-765, the travel permit and the biometrics. This is a huge, huge increase. Um, I don't know how, you know, individuals are gonna be able to afford the fight, just the filing fee for these applications. That's more than doubling, more than tripling from 1,225 to almost $4,000. And the I-130 and the going from 535 to 820. So filing for adjustment of status before this filing fee increase is implemented is definitely a great idea. Um, we don't know exactly when that's gonna go into play. They've made the announcement, they've been having their meetings, but right now it's still just a proposed fee increase. Hopefully um, we'll see a change in the increase that they're proposing, but that's what we are facing currently. Great. Uh, let me go ahead and take you to, let me take you through the, the following websites, which are actually going to be very helpful to you during your process because you can do, uh, there are various topics we can touch on. Um, one is the case inquiries. So as the attorney was saying, um, these are useful whenever we have, um, whenever we have, uh, one moment, please. Whenever we have applications outside of the normal processing time, which is the most common reason why people do these um, case inquiries. So you would just go to the USCIS uh, .gov website, and you can go directly to each link, depending on the kind of service request or case inquiry that you're looking for. Um, status updates that we that we encourage you to do is if you already have a pending I-130 application or I-485, we encourage you to go to the case status website where you can type in your receipt number and get an answer as to what the status of your current application is. And also to check on the processing times depending on the form that you're looking into um, and where your case was sent to, let's say I-130 petition for alien resident, spouse, children under 21, depending on where the USCIS sends your case, you're gonna wanna look into let's say Texas Service Center, and they'll tell you approximately how many, how much time it's taking at each service center. Um, yeah, uh, you know, let's move on to the next portion of the presentation. Give me one moment, please. All right, so, why hire an attorney to help you with the process? One of the uh, questions that we have recurrent in our chat right now is, can I do it on my own? What do you think, attorney? So, you know, obviously, technically speaking, of course, you can do it on your own. Um, would I recommend that? No. When you use an attorney to help you with your file, what you're getting is, number one, the, the experience, number two, the help with the follow-ups, Number three, um, you know that you're putting together a stronger package. So I've had, I've had cases where um, the immigrant comes to me because USCIS has sent them a request for additional evidence and in their minds are like, I have nothing else to send. But when I sit down with them and I listen to them and we go through my checklist and I customize the checklist for them and we help them with um, making sure that their affidavits are strong and that we're helping their family and friends with affidavits, that file is approved, right? Because because of our experience, we know how to put together a stronger package. And using an attorney and using you know our law firm would give you that sense of peace of mind that you know your case is being taken care of, and you're always going to be getting updates. You know the packet was sent out, the packet was received, here's the receipt, these are the next steps, do you have any questions? This is what we're here for, to make sure that your life is a little easier going through this 
life-changing process. You know, immigration is something that changes everyone's life. Being able to have an access to a green card is something that changes your life and your entire family's life. So, you know, I've gone through um, the immigration process. A lot of our staff are immigrants, we understand. So this is really our pleasure and we understand the importance of this kind of work. That's right. Um, okay, so I think we should open the floor at this point to uh, any of our participants who have any questions or additional um, comments regarding adjustment of status or the green card through marriage process. Um, I do want to remind you guys that you can reach us at 305-371-8846 or at elizelawfirm.com to schedule your complimentary consultation out of, uh, which is a gift from us to you for assisting today's uh, conference. So let's move on to the questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and share the website. I see someone is asking for the website again. Oh yeah, please. When you go on our website and it's also on the screen, you are able to contact us through the website as well. And um, you'll have someone reach back out to you via email. We do a lot of video conference calls so we can set up, regardless of where the person is, a Zoom call or Google Meets call or a phone call to discuss whatever issues that they have. Okay. Uh, so one of the questions here is, uh, let's see. Should I file just for the I-130 or should I also file for I-485? So that's really gonna depend on whether the immigrant qualifies for adjustment of status and where the immigrant physically is. So this is definitely a case where I would advise, you know, reach out to us and I can review your file for free and we'll be able to guide you a little bit better. Okay, great. Um, let's see, we have another question in our Q&A. If I got my green card through VAWA and remarried after four years, would I be eligible to apply for citizen, citizenship and petition for my current spouse? So that's a very complicated case. Um, we didn't touch on VAWA today and I'm happy to review your case. It's gonna depend on a lot of different factors. So reach out to us and I'm happy to do that one-on-one -on -one with you. Um, for those who are, are not aware, VAWA is, stands for Violence Against Women's Act, but it helps both women and men who are victims of domestic violence, both physical and emotional, sexual, financial, when they're married to a U.S. citizen. So if you find yourself married to a U.S. citizen and they are abusing you physically or emotionally, financially, et cetera, we, we've helped people with that. We've helped both men and women successfully get their own green cards through the VAWA process. Okay. And another question. Uh, so... This person is really interested in getting the process started, but they don't have all the resources together. They're asking if we offer plans. Yes, so when it plans when it comes to payment plans, I would imagine. Yes, correct. Yes, so at our firm, we definitely provide different payment plans. Um, we are happy to work with you and your family and come up with something that works for, for, for both you and the firm. Okay. So I have another question here in our chat. It says, once we have an approved I-485, they're asking if the social security, um, yeah. their social security card would come automatically <clears throat> with the work visa, or is this something that we apply for separately? So that's a great question. Um, when you apply for a 485, if you had, there's been a lot of changes. Before you were not able to, request a social security number on the 485 by itself, but now you can. Before it was only through the work permit application. The answer is on a practical level, if it's been more than two weeks after the approval of the 485 and you don't have your social security card yet, call the social security office, make an appointment at your local social, local social security office and they will give you that social security card. 
what I've seen in the last year is um, very often you, USCIS would fail to, or there was a miscommunication between immigration and social security and social security would not issue the social security cards. They're doing a lot better now, but you know, my advice is to wait, wait about two weeks. And if you still don't get it, go to your local social security office, give them a copy of your approvals um, and they'll be able to issue that social security number for you. Okay. Um, what about, you, you know, something that you mentioned earlier, attorney, was the ability to get a temporary driver license for the person who is adjusting status or is in the process of adjusting status. How long does it take for a person to be able to get this, this form of state ID while they're in the process of waiting? What do you think, attorney? So it's going to vary depending on the state that you're currently in. Um, each state has a different requirement for IEDs, right? So in Florida, where you are right now, as soon as you have a copy of the pending receipts for the packet that was sent in, so the I-130 and the 45, you will be eligible for a driver's license, a temporary driver's license. So once the application is sent out, currently we're seeing that it takes about 10 days to get a receipt in the mail. So once we get that receipt, and oftentimes because you have an attorney on your case, that receipt is sent both to the law firm and also to the applicants. Um, we're seeing very often that we're getting them a little quicker. So we're able to scan them and send them over to our clients so that they see, okay, this was received, this is what's going on. Um, and they're able to move forward like that. Okay, and I think one of our last questions just to wrap up today's meeting and also because I know it's something that everyone is very much concerned about and it's, can I travel or how does the travel permit work while I am adjusting status? That's a great question. So with the application process, we do apply for an I-131, which is a temporary travel permit for our, um, our clients, but we do advise them that be careful and try to avoid traveling. This is something that a lot of attorneys tell their clients because even when the travel document is approved, when you read the travel document very closely, it says in some circumstances, there may be, um, you're not guaranteed re-entry into the US. So if you are able to avoid traveling, then the best thing to do is to avoid traveling on that I-131 while your adjustment status is pending. If you have to travel and your adjustment status is pending, make sure that the I-131 is current, that it was approved, that it's in your hand, that it's not expired. Because if you travel without an approved I-131 that's current, then your adjustment status will be deemed to have been abandoned, okay? Okay. Um, those are all really great, great questions. I know that the attorney, uh, attorney, you wanted to run us through your, through the website very quickly. And I think that's a really great idea. So, um, why don't we go ahead and share the website? Um, so we can also see what areas of immigration you are able to assist our future clients with. Sure. Go right ahead. Okay. Just one moment. Well, Catalina, I guess that pulled up. Um, again, I wanna really thank everyone for participating today. I hope that this was helpful and you guys got something from it. And I definitely wanna encourage everyone to please reach out to us, send us comments, emails as to other topics you'd like us to cover. You know, I'm happy to do more of these webinars and I'm happy to kind of cater them to what you guys are wanting to hear from us on. So we have um, our website up. This is the Elise Law Firm website okay. and are able to contact us through the firm. Um, there's a contact us page. Right over here. Which on is the right. left. Correct. So what happens, Catalina, when they go on the website and they put in their request on in that box? So as soon as you fill this out, this request out, we'll get an immediate email notification that you've sent something to us. And our team 
of very dedicated individuals is going to be there to answer you the best way that we possibly can. Uh, I will also remind you that you have a free consultation credit to your favor um, for any of the topics that you'd like to discuss. Um, so feel free to write to us via the website, our phone number 305-371-8846 to schedule your free consultation. Um, you'll also notice that on the bottom of the website, we have uh, our phone number available. We are also available for in-person consultations. Um, and the next portion that we wanted to show you is uh, the areas of immigration that we do specialize in and are highly experienced with. So today we're focused on the family marriage um, section of immigration law, but we do have experience helping people in the sports and entertainment field. So for example, we have worked with a lot of um, music groups, music bands. We've, all, we've also helped athletes like um, swimmers get not only their temporary work visas, but also possibly a green card through their profession. Um, we can also help with US citizenship and US green cards through family relationship or business visas, H-1B visas, um, deportation defense, investor visas. We've dealt with asylum in the past. Um, the I-9 audits, the student visas and deferred action. So I-9 audits is something that we've actually, you know, with everything going on here um, in the US and Florida, we've actually seen a lot more inquiries for just with the change in Florida law. Perfect. So um, we can't wait to hear from you. We are so grateful for uh, having your participation with us today. And uh, we'll be happy to have you via our phone line, 305-371-8846 or elizelawfirm.com. All right. Great, guys. Thank you for participating. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Have a nice evening. Goodbye.